In 2009, a respected but rather racy science porn magazine for nerds called New Scientist in Britain ran a scandalous cover. The cover said Darwin was wrong. Now, if you run a cover like that, you're going to get some flack. And the editor got a lot of flack because in the midst of the Darwin Wars against the creationists, the last thing scientists wanted to see was basically creationists quoting a headline from a respected scientific magazine saying that Darwin was wrong. Of course, it was all tongue-in-cheek and basically just a ploy to sell more magazines. What they were really saying was the view of the Darwin had and Darwin's tree of life was wrong. But in essence, the theory itself, the Darwinian mechanism to explain how evolution happens, of course, remains sacrosanct. But I'm going to tell you something that I hope makes you doubt the Darwinian mechanism itself. Now, you'd be quite forgiven for saying that thousands upon thousands of scientists will graduate every year from college, and they'll be biologists, they'll be the Evo Devo crowd, they'll be bioinformatics, they'll be experimental biologists, and experimental evolutionists even. How could it be that all these thousands of experts could be wrong? Surely it's better to believe all of them than to believe some guy on a boat in Greece. Well, all I can say is that makes a lot of sense, but I would remind you that I'm about to try to convince you that Darwin is wrong not from a new load of evidence that contradicts the evidence that the Darwinists have, but by taking the mountains and mountains of evidence that the Darwinists have collected and reinterpreting them in a way that says that Darwin was wrong. The very evidence that they've collected to support Darwin, I think, actually refutes him. How could that be? Well, it goes back to something like Ptolemaic epicycles. So, Ptolemy was an astronomer in about 200 AD, and he had a complete system that animated the heavens, and it worked. It predicted where planets would be and how the Earth rotated the seasons. But it was wrong. It was an Earth-centric model. Now, as we all know today, the Earth revolves around the Sun. But Ptolemy's system actually predicted quite accurately, not perfectly, but reasonably well, exactly what the planets did, including retrograde motion and things that are very hard to understand in an Earth-centric model. But if everything, including the Sun, went round the Earth, it was just possible to make the model work if you said there were these epicycles, that there were sequence and quants and all these complicated fudges that really made the system work. Now, the thing about Ptolemaic epicycles is they lasted for 1,300 years without question. If you were a guy sailing around Greece on a boat and you, in those times, contradicted the Ptolemaic model, you would be considered an absolute crackpot, even though it was wrong. The Ptolemaic system lasted until the Renaissance, when Copernicus came along and said that it was far more likely that the Sun was the center of the solar system rather than the Earth. And this heliocentric model then described the Earth and other planets orbiting the Sun, the model that you were taught in school today. But it was completely heterodox. And when he introduced it, the remarkable thing is that it didn't work quite as well as the model that was incorrect which was the Ptolemaic epicycles. It took until Kepler came along and demonstrated that the planets moved in elliptical orbits before things started to work out and the Ptolemaic model was finally superseded. It's all a question of interpretation of the existing evidence that you can go from an Earth-centric to a heliocentric model of the planets and the planetary system. And likewise, I think it's the same with Darwinism.
Darwin and the Darwin mechanism, his theory is fundamentally wrong. But it's become so entrenched as a view that every new bit of evidence, even contradictory evidence, is twisted to make it fit the prevailing model. For scientists, it's career suicide to contradict Darwin. But over half the people on Earth are so horrified by what Darwinism reveals about our origins, they just refuse to believe it. It's even better that you're a creationist if you, cre if you contradict Darwin, because at least then they can say, well, you, you're just weak and you can't psychologically take the truth of a harsh, doggy dog red in tooth and claw universe, a kind of really bleak and nihilistic view of what creation really is. And it's understandable if you don't have the heart to face the truth and you lapse into thinking there's some kind of deity and there's some supernatural explanation for why there's order and why there's life in the universe. But I think that if you take the science, you can see that there is a more neutral and contradictory explanation for the origins of life. So from here on out, I assume that if I had any credibility before, I'm about to lose it because if anybody steps forward, especially uh, non-scientists, and says that what Darwin said is not true, when they're not even a creationist, then you really are a kook and you instantly laughed off stage. If you say that the facts point to Darwin's theory being wrong, then you really do have a fight on your hands. It's going to take quite a few videos, but I'm going to try to convince you that Darwin's theory is absolutely wrong. It's not a good explanation for the origins of order and an explanation for life and hence an explanation for us. Now in this episode and subsequent ones, let's dissect Darwin's theory and I'll tell you why I think it's wrong. And I promise that in future episodes, I'll give you a replacement theory. Because as many biologists have said, that if Darwin's theory of evolution is wrong, then nothing that happens in nature makes any sense. Now scientists don't usually say that a theory is wrong. They normally say it's incomplete or it needs modification. It's kind of rude to come out and say that one of the greatest theories of all time was actually wrong. But in Darwin's case is a special case. He is actually fundamentally wrong. Now before we go much further, we better review exactly what Darwin's theory says. Because when you argue with Darwinists, they tend to do this little switcheroo and they switch from arguing that Darwin's mechanism was incorrect or correct and start arguing as if you said evolution is not correct. Now evolution is absolutely correct. It's established. The problem is the theory of evolution was not Darwin's theory. The theory of evolution, as Darwin said in Origin of the Species, preceded him by thousands of years. Anaximander and Empedocles had a theory of evolution that said plants and animals actually change over time and evolve. The idea that they were entirely static and immutable species came from a slight deviation that we took in Christianity, but it's entirely a side issue. And in the ages after monsters died, perforce there perished many a stock unable by propagation to forge a progeny. For whatever creatures thou beholdest breathing the breath of life, the same have been even from their earliest age preserved alive by cunning or by valour, or at least by speed of foot or wing. And many a stock remaineth yet because of the use to man. Lucretius, in about 50 BC. So the idea that species mutated and evolved has really nothing to do with Darwin. Charles Darwin was born in 1809 into a well-off Shropshire family. His grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, had already written about evolution at a time when nearly everyone else in Britain believed in the literal truth of the Bible. Even his close friend, Charles Lyell had a theory of evolution and Darwin borrowed that theory of evolution and used it in the origin of species. So what exactly is Darwin's contribution? Darwin's contribution is the exact mechanism for how species evolved. 
Now in the popular imagination, Darwin's theory is essentially survival of the fittest. Now that's Herbert Spencer's phrase. Darwin never used that phrase and Darwinists tend to shy away from it today. They prefer the phrase survival of the best adapted because survival of the fittest led to essentially eugenics and a logical extension of Darwin's theory ultimately tends to end up in the death camps of Auschwitz. What's implied in social Darwinism is that you might as well give nature a helping hand and help it along to perfect your species or at the very least say that if you really doing enforced sterilizations uh, of people that are considered maybe undesirables in terms of eugenic fitness then uh, that's quite acceptable. It's the natural way and there's nothing really wrong with it. Something which Darwinists struggle to actually argue against. Suffice to say that we're bigger than evolution now and we can elect not to use it. A very weak argument against where Darwinism actually winds up if you take a logical extension of what he said. But let's get back to precisely what the Darwinian theory says and let's try and stick to it and I'll remind you of it again and again because we're not talking about evolution. No one really seriously doubts evolution, even perhaps creationists. What's doubted is that at the heart of the evolutionary mechanism, the thing that is making life itself more complex, which eventually gets to complex organisms and conscious organisms like ourselves, is the Darwinian mechanism. It's mutation with a beneficial effect. And let's put it on the record for exactly what Darwin's theory is. Let Dickie Dawkins explain it to you. Darwin himself put it that if you have overproduction, which naturally every creature does, you get more children produced than that can ever possibly survive. That leads to competition. So the individuals that survive and the individuals that reproduce are the ones that are best at surviving and best at reproducing. In the last video I talked about competition and I talked about my skepticism of competition in general. Competition is not really scientific. It's really a psychological interpretation and that's what I'm going to try to convince you of. That's not the evidence that nature presents to us. That's the evidence our brain presents to us. The Darwinian explanation is really from your alien cortex, from your left brain. And the reason it's persisted for 200 years or so is because it fits the way our psychology works and not because it fits the evidence from nature. Darwin got his theory from Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus said, that in urban areas the human population increases exponentially but the food supply only increases logarithmically. So that leads us to competition and finally to a Malthusian catastrophe and collapse. Malthus was concerned with humans rather than animals. He believed that the world's population was expanding faster than the food supplies and that people would have to compete in a fight for survival. Now Darwin took that theory and said perhaps that applies in nature and he used Malthus theory which was really about people in urban areas and said that's the way it works overall in nature. Malthus forecast inevitable starvation unless people curb their reproduction. Now the fascinating thing is that Darwin was reading Malthus when he got the idea for natural selection. The idea of a rapid increase in population which inevitably would lead to competition and it was that, that was the spark that lit in Darwin's mind. Now it's ironic that in the complete inversion of things now we're taught in school that Malthus was wrong about populations in general and so we think that Malthus is wrong and Darwin is right but I think it's exactly the, or the other way around. Malthus is right there is a Malthusian catastrophe and it's all to do with the dynamics of urban populations. But I'll come back to that. Where Darwin is wrong is that Malthusianism doesn't actually apply in nature. What he's doing is what I've said in previous videos and that's to assume that there's competition in terms of a zero-sum game with saddle points. Darwin's Damascus moment, his epiphany, 
happened 22 years before he wrote On the Origin of Species. One summer in 1837, an idea suddenly flashed into his head. He turned the page in his notebook and wrote, I think, and then scribbled this diagram. It was a tree, a tree that strongly resembled the grand family trees that hung in the posh atriums and entrance halls of his friends and colleagues, all of whom were fellow aristocrats like him. But this was no ordinary tree. Darwin's extension of the aristocratic icon was to become the cornerstone of Western thinking, not just in biology, but in social philosophy, religion, economics, and ultimately, politics. Darwin's sketch has since become known as the Tree of Life. It's remarkable how the tree figures as a central icon in so many of the world's belief systems. For example, Idgazil, at the heart of Norse mythology, the alchemist Tree of Life, the Bodhisattva tree, or the myth of Adam and Eve and the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. As it turns out, Darwin's tree of life was as fictional as any other tree at the heart of a faith-based religion. Darwin's faith-based religion held its faith in the automatic assumption that there was a tree of life. But he was wrong. Darwin was so convinced that the tree of life was an absolute fact of nature, that it never occurred to him that he could be wrong. The launching point of his entire theory was actually an endeavor to explain something that he thought was so self-evident you couldn't argue with it, and that's that there was a tree of descent in the natural world. Modern genetics has confirmed its fundamental truth. All life is related. And it enables us to construct with confidence the complex tree that represents the history of life. But that idea turns out, rather shockingly, to be incorrect. What overtoned it was gene sequencing and the discoveries that we've made about the genome. The sensational cover in New Scientist was actually dismissing and cutting down the idea that there was this tree of linear descent that Darwin thought, and was replacing it with an idea that really the tree is a kind of a braid. It's a really complicated network. It's a mesh or a web of descent that really defies Darwin's linearism. But it was the central point of Darwin's theory. In fact, his whole evolutionary hypothesis was to explain what he thought was a self-evident tree of life. That's the tree of life, he thought, demanded an explanation. And his theory of evolution was that explanation. So right from the beginning, his launching point was actually a false premise. Now, the confounding factor that has actually cut down his idea of a tree of life is what's called horizontal gene transfer or lateral gene transfer. Since the discovery of DNA, it's been discovered that as we sequence more and more genomes of more and more species, it turns out that it's not a linear descent in a tree of life as Darwin thought. It's more like a braid. It's really a web of life. And inheritance can actually come horizontally. Take this example from the common cow. It may amaze you to know that the defining gene of the domestic cow and cattle is what's called Bov B. Although the snake is not one of the cow's ancestors, did you know that you could find the signature gene of a cow in a snake? Genetic studies have shown that a particular bovine gene, a cut-and-paste gene called a transposon, as popular and repetitive as Ravel's bolero, called Bov B, turns up rather unexpectedly in the snake. And not only in the snake. If Darwin had sketched out the genetic family tree of the zebrafish, for example, he would have had to somehow include the cow as one of its ancestors, because it too has inherited the Bov B gene. And not only the zebrafish. The same is true of elephants, horses, geckos, pythons, sea snakes, and even duck-billed platypuses. Not to mention the purple sea urchin and the silkworm. They have all somehow managed to acquire the cow's signature gene. It's almost as if cows had a wicked sense of humor and a time machine. An even stranger example is the example of eyes. 
Eyes evolved many times independently in different organisms. But how the squid got its eyes must have been the strangest of all. The master control gene for eyes is a gene called PAC6. And cephalopods, that is the squid, cuttlefish, octopus, got their eyes from horizontal gene transfer. PAC6 appeared spontaneously in some individual and suddenly cephalopods had eyes for the first time. Imagine what that squid must have felt like, the first individual to be born with eyes amongst its blind relatives. It must have seemed like some kind of cuttlefish messiah. Cuttlefish could not see, and then suddenly one of them, thanks to the PAC-6 horizontal gene transfer from some other organism that had eyes, suddenly eyes were transferred to the cuttlefish, and one individual could suddenly see. Presumably, if Darwin's theory is correct, that conferred such an advantage on that squid that eyes then became the only thing that was viable in the squid's environment, and it forced out all its blind relatives. Today, cephalopods have eyes. They are all descendants from that one lucky individual that by chance got the Pax 6 gene from some unknown other organism that had eyes. Probably it was something that its parents ate. The point is, genes are not passed down neatly and vertically down from parent to offspring as Darwin's theory requires. And the further back you go in the order of phyla, the worse it gets. By the time you get down to the bacteria and archaea, things border on the ridiculous. These were the seeds from which the tree of life developed. They were able to split, replicating themselves as bacteria do. Asexual microorganisms commonly inherit about 10% of their genome, internalizing it from foreign organisms in their vicinity every single time they reproduce. So after only 10 generations, previous ancestry is almost completely meaningless. What it means is that if Darwin's theory has any application in nature, it must be late and peripheral in the evolutionary history. And on evolutionary timescales, if Darwin's mechanism exists at all, it must have been irrelevant for billions and billions of years. The total biomass of bacteria is probably about equal to that of plants. So for the vast majority of animals and organisms on Earth, Darwin's theory is absolutely meaningless. If it has any application at all, it must be just on the fringe as a footnote basically just to apex predators in exotic locations like the Serengeti. Bacteria and archaea are the common ancestors of all living things. Microbes were the only living things on Earth for 2.1 billion years. So if Darwin's explanation and Darwin's mechanism is not good at explaining their evolution, I don't think it's much good at explaining anything at all. The primary source of variation in bacteria and microbes is horizontal gene transfer. Single nucleotide polymorphisms, just single mutations that were part of the gradualism of uh, what traditionally was thought of as Darwinian evolution, has happened very, very seldom. The genome replicates with very, very high fidelity. But if there's horizontal gene transfer, it makes for a very, very noisy environment. And it's hard to see how Darwin's signal, basically a beneficial mutation, could propagate in that noisy environment. But maybe there's a way to rescue his theory by saying that, well, it's all about the genes. It's a gene-centric universe. Dickie Dawkins, in his book, The Selfish Gene, made the claim that the unit of selection is the gene. So therefore it kind of works out so that you would have, say, a Michael Jordan gene that could be shared amongst sports teams in tournaments. So then the sports teams would be the animal, the phenotype, and the gene that was actually being selected would be a super beneficial gene, basically a one player in the team like Michael Jordan. So if you have a super gene that, be, that uh, can make a huge advantage to the team's so competitive success, then uh, that could actually be replicated horizontally and teams that got the Michael Jordan gene would then become more successful.
The problem is that the genetic record in the genome doesn't support that kind of propagation. Imagine now going back to what I said in the previous video about competition. If a Michael Jordan gene could be transferred horizontally, it would be the equivalent of, say, a Rochambeau or rock, paper, scissors tournament. So imagine all the teams are actually in a tournament, a competitive tournament, and you would get a new gene that would amount to, say, a rock gene. Then uh, you would expect that some other organism, some other team, would then quickly evolve something like a paper gene to foil that. And likewise, then, some other organism would evolve a scissors gene to foil that. But you wind up in a zero-sum game without saddle points, and just an endless tournament and competition that, if you remember from the last video, could only be resolved as a beneficial or deleterious mutation based on how you actually framed the game. And nature has no way of framing the game in that kind of way. So it doesn't appear that there is such a thing as a super gene like a Michael Jordan gene that then is a meme that suddenly gets shared amongst lots of animals by horizontal gene transfer rather than basically hereditary and lineal descent. So if there is a selfish gene and the gene is the unit of heredity, as Dickie Dawkins actually said in his book, The Selfish Gene, then you should actually see this gene appear and become uh, the unit that propagates itself. There should be a genetic tree of life for these beneficial genes. But the evidence for that is not really there. And there's something else to say about the selfish gene. And just to be beyond any shadow of doubt, that whole notion of the selfish gene, you think that is now a, a rather antiquated vision of, or version of, of, of natural selection. I've abandoned it, and I think uh, most serious scientists working on it have abandoned it. Scientists like E.O. Wilson have pointed out that there is probably multi-level selection, and the unit of selection is something like a Russian doll. Selection is happening at all levels. Remember that Darwin thought that there was variation in individuals. Those individuals competed because there was more progeny than the environment supported. And the ones that were best at competing and best at propagating themselves then went forward. So the unit of selection for Darwin was the organism or animal, the phenotype itself. He didn't really know about genes. But the idea that the gene can be the unit of selection isn't really supported. But if the phenotype is not the unit of selection and the tree of life is an illusion, it really begs the question why we still believe in Darwin's theory. This idea of competition between members of the same species had a profound effect on Darwin's own ideas. To me, competition isn't really a scientific concept. It's a psychological interpretation of behavior. And it's not really measurable. It's, it's not really quantifiable. It's not numerical. So, for example, Darwinists tend to use phrases like evolutionary pressure, and they never seem to question exactly what evolutionary pressure is or what it exactly means or how you actually quantify it. For example, what's the SI unit, the standard unit of measure for evolutionary pressure? How would you measure it? Let me make a suggestion that from here on out, scientists should adopt the gullible as the word for the basic unit of evolutionary pressure. So, if uh, some organism develops horns, you would say that it developed horns under a gullibility of basically a hundred gullibles. Of course, that would be complete and utter nonsense. But so is the idea that there's some kind of hydraulic pressure, this evolutionary pressure that's molding animals and organisms, plants, bacteria. Every living thing is being somehow hydraulically compressed and molded into the organisms and species that we see today. What I would say is that species are actually being molded from the bottom up. Darwin and the creationists have the whole thing completely inverted. What species are and the origins of order, the origins of species, comes from the microbiology, 
It comes from the biochemistry. It comes from the immutable physics and the basically mathematics of how molecules arrange themselves, in particular how DNA reaches stable structures. But life, everything including us and eventually consciousness, is an emergent feature that goes all the way back to basically the geometry of molecules and the necessity of mathematics. What nature is doing is actually algorithms. It's like a giant physical computer. And life emerges bottom up from that. It doesn't get shaped like Darwin thought, top down by the environment imposing pressure on organisms and shaping them. Darwin simply thought that the environment just was replacing God. But in essence, it's just making a God out of the environment, and it's barely an improvement on the creationist model. And it's about as scientific as the creationist model, so it's no surprise that creationists and Darwinists have met their match in each other, and still in America they lock horns. It's ironic that as we stand on the brink of human extinction, the things that got us there, the engine that drove it, competition and religion, are celebrated as constructive forces when the evidence and the history shows conclusively that it's the exact opposite. Even the mathematics, as von Neumann pointed out, shows that competition is a destructive force. It's not a constructive force. And the reason we think otherwise is because of our left brain linear thinking, our reductionism, the scheming part of our brain that I call the alien cortex. Darwin took the engine that generated the alien cortex, that is the city and urbanization, and without realizing that it was the maladaptive brain that he had, he took Malthus's idea about how the city evolves into a catastrophe and he applied it to nature and assumed that it was constructive. The exact opposite of what I believe. Intense heat and ambition that was to prove fatal. Russian Vladimir Lajensky was one of the favorites to be defending homegrown champion Timo Kakonin. Vladimir died on the spot shortly afterwards and Timo Kakonin is in hospital in serious condition. The head of the competition has expressed grief and sadness, and questions are still being asked. Learn, goddammit. 